Well, thank you very much for coming this early. As I went to sleep yesterday, well, as I went to sleep this morning at 4.30, after showing the, the movie in the culinary section, I was wondering if I would be able to deliver this speech. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you <coughs> for uh, inviting me to do this lecture. I'm not only a member of the European Film Academy, I'm actually deputy chairman right now. Uh, and uh, <coughs> I have other companies, uh, Zampa, Zampa Audiovisual, Zebra, and I am the director general of a sales company called Latido Films, and I've been in the Berlinale in the market since uh, for one week now, so I'm selling my movies. So this is almost the, the end of my stay in the, in the city. I wanted first to show you 10 minutes of the film that we did the world premiere yesterday. It's actually a documentary, it's an actual documentary on wine. So um, I wanted to, to call my lecture Food for Thought. And I think it was very, very adequate that I would show you some, some of the gastronomic things. It was in the official section in the culinary cinema, as I say, which is one of the the, the sections that are growing more in the festival right now, and, and, I, and it's been very successful. And the dinner that they gave us yesterday was very successful, and the wine was very successful, and we are destroyed. So please uh, see the film, and I'll try then to deliver something coherent for you, and maybe have some thoughts coming back from you. Okay, thank you very much. This is a, a one hour and a half long movie which is the result of more than 120 hours of shooting, which we have managed more or less to reduce in one of the regions in Spain that produces the older wines. Of course, you just noticed it's called Sherry or Jerez. It's been mentioned by Shakespeare. It appears in Henry V, already mentioned, and uh, all over the place. And this region, which is down in the south, uh, actually, this is a work of peace because there are some different producers and they all hate each other. And the only thing that brought them together is that we did this movie. So yesterday we were celebrating and they were all there and they were all very happy, which is like one of the few times that they can get together without you know, quarreling about the quality of the wines and whatever. Okay. <clears throat> um, what I wanted is to challenge you with some ideas, basically about what is the role of films and what is it that you maybe can, can do to, to understand what we do. The first thought, which I've always questioned, is imagine that there is no more people on Earth or that we, all the people went to another planet outside and after years, millenniums, they come back and they land on Earth and the only documents to, to show what is it, what we are, who we are, are the movies. And they land in Hollywood. What type of society do you think they can uh, derive from the analysis of all those movies with action, superheroes, killing, bombings, kidnaps, murders. Imagine if they just find a selection of television programs and they realize that basically people were killed every six or seven, every half an hour. No? Like, and, and, and there were a lot of people trying to investigate why and, and then <coughs> the, the following day they would kill another some people and they would investigate why, etc., etc., in a long succession. Just imagine, no? just imagine if instead of finding hieroglyphics in Egypt, we would find the libraries of Hollywood. Or imagine that we arrive to the Berlinale, to the official selection, and they realize that this was probably a very broken society where there were rapes and incest and cruelty, because that's basically what is about the, the official selection, our movies, very sad movies. Will that tell us something about us? Just that that's the first question, and I'll try to answer it later. But then, imagine a world where a creator does a movie, and the politicians that are supporting through fiscal mechanisms, or through the subsidies, or through political help or lobbying, decide, 
that doesn't represent what I want to say. Imagine a world where there could be only propaganda and there would be no freedom to tell the stories that we want to tell. Imagine, for instance, recently uh, an Ukrainian movie, Levi Leviathan, who won the Golden Globe. It has been supported <clears throat> from some help from the Russian government, but because they thought it was a small movie by a creator, no, no impact whatsoever. Suddenly it wins the Golden Globe in the United States, and what does the government in Russia say? We have to take off the money, it doesn't represent us, because it doesn't tell the ideas that we want people to understand about our country. Or right now in Israel, where there are serious th uh, threats from, from the current government to stop the fantastic work that some of the, of the funding bodies, the Foundation for Cinema, is doing, supporting both Israeli and Palestinian movies so the voices of the people can be heard. They say, why should we support movies that are telling that we are maybe not doing the right things? We should only support things that are telling what we want to do. Is that the type of, 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 of world we want to live? Or a world in which a movie <clears throat> like Timbuktu uh, has to be retired from a film festival in Belgium because of threat of the Islamists, because they don't like the way um, uh, 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 what is uh, Ivory Coast director has shown the cruelty of the Taliban's way they enter a town and how much it hurts the current lives of, of, of normal people. What type of world do we want? Can we have uh, people telling the stories? Can we not? Can we have the money dictating what stories should be told or not? Second question. But what type of films actually could serve the cause of peace? So what is peace? The understanding among human bodies, the understanding among countries, understanding of civilizations. How do we understand? How can we really find peace and help to promote peace? Through movies that present violence? Why not? Because sometimes by seeing the reality, you understand the problems and the challenges. By showing uh, happiness, yes, because by bringing happiness into the lives of people, bringing comedy, we understand each other, we can, we can feel better about us. By exploring the hidden secrets of, uh, of, of politicians, of societies, by, by, by showing how corruption has worked sometimes, can we allow our politicians or our governments to censor movies that discover, or documentaries that discover the inner works of their, of, of their meddlings, etc. Can they censor that or not? Well, that's a little another question. I think that films and in extension the narrative form that also you can see on television that tells story, storytelling is fundamental for the cause of peace and is fundamental for the understanding of human beings. Storytelling is at the heart of what we are and what we do. And it's not only the new exception of the term storytelling, like we have to create a story that people believe so we communicate. Yes. No, it's a storytelling as a way to tell what we are, what our roots are, where do we come from, what do we want to express. So there is another challenge nowadays, which is whether we should do movies to make money, which we should because I am a producer. If I don't make money, I don't pay the salaries of the people that work with me. I don't pay anyone. They cannot pay the school of their children. They cannot pay the food. So at the end, it's a, it's a whole chain. So I need to earn the money back of my investment. This is sometimes the critic says, oh, the producers want to make money. Well, yes, <laughs> I have to because, well, or I can ask everybody to work for free. And then is there, is there, is there a problem? No? So in, in normally we want to make money. But of course, this is a, can be a huge industry. I work in a small industry in Spain, and actually becoming smaller and smaller and smaller as uh, these years are coming by. Um, <clears throat> but I've worked also in the bigger industry, the American industry, industry that creates images of people, creates uh, brands, brands. I mean, the actors are becoming brands. Uh, someone like Brad Pitt 
is no longer Brad Pitt. It's the image projected of Brad Pitt that then he can use for what? For causes for peace. So is it good that Brad Pitt is using his image or, or, or his wife for the cause of peace? I think so. I think it's fantastic. What I think is reductionist is that people only listen to the cause because there is this brand, because they have seen it killing a lot of people in a movie in, that has been done. Because do we have to do only the movies that make the people go to the theaters? Or maybe we can make the movies that make the people think when they come out of the theaters. Do we have to do movies only one way? Or there are a lot of ways in which we can do movies. Nowadays, as you know, and if you look around, the globalization, as they call it, is, is like sort of throwing us into the arms of one unified way of telling everything. I think we should open that up. And it's for people like you that are going to communicate, our industries that are going to talk about it, to understand that sometimes in the difference of the, of the way we present the, the ideas is on the narrative, it's also the power of communication, the power for people to express the real nature of how they talk. Because it is not true that we all talk the same. It is not true that we understand stories the same way. It is not true that we feel the, the world around us the same way. That's what they tell us in the mass media. But the reality is that when we grow in our own families, we all develop our own environments. And it's not the same environment what you can find in a family in Spain that you can find even in a very near country like Italy. We are different and we are same. How we explore that through the images, how can we, can, we can tell the story so others understand us is also the duty of cinema. And it is in a way being lost somehow except thanks to festivals like the Berlinale, which I have not criticized, but show that they are paying attention to a lot of violence because they think they have to challenge, but also they show the voice, uh, they, they open the space to different voices. So, at the end, what type of society will they see about us? What type of movies will be our legacy? I mean, are we really a, a society in which only um, uh, comic book Avengers uh, solve the problems of civilization while destroying everything around? Because it's incredible the amount of destruction that they can cause in a single city. If I would be living with these people, I'd say, no, go to the other one. <laughs> to the other one. No, not here. No, because, oh my God, every battle they destroy 120 buildings. Oh, yeah. oh my God. With, uh, well. or, or are we, are we going to try to do the movies that would talk about ourselves and that people would recognize the type of human, of persons that we wanted to be, the achievements we wanted to have, the, 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 the dreams we have. Because at the end, bottom line, on every construction of narration, you have one person that wants to do something, faces some challenges, and overcomes or not them. That's the basic construction of narrative. And that how I think we all, of, we all see ourselves. We wake up in the morning and we say, my God, well, today I have to go to school, I have an exam, okay, did I study enough? Mm, I don't know, will I overcome it? Will I pass it? Will I not? Will I, will I find a job? Uh, will I be okay in this interview? Will I get what I want? Will I get my dreams? I have dreamt to do that. Will I achieve it or not? And I think this is part of what we every, every day we go through as we, as we as we live. And that's the basic construction of a movie. If you look at it, if you look at any movie, you will find exactly that's the basic construction, told in different ways and representing different cultures. So my provocation here, and it's a short lecture that I'm doing, my provocation here is how, how can we help that movies help the cause of peace? How can we help to guarantee plurality of expression. So people from all forms of culture, all languages can express themselves. This is being threatened. Because more and more, look at the, look at the commercials, more and more only three or four actors are announcing four or five uh, uh, sport, uh, top sport people, etc. Before there were like more people, but now everything is concentrated. Everything is concentrated in few groups. Everything is concentrated in one way of thinking. I think we have 
to support diversity. It is good that there are big uh, companies and so that is fantastic, but it's also good that there are small or smaller companies doing what they think they can do in a very good way and that they can communicate their specificity. Here at the Berlinale, one of the so far highest rated movies that has been shown is a movie from Guatemala, spoken in Maya. And I think if I, someone comes to me as a salesperson and they tell me, do you want a movie in Maya? I would say, no, English is the, world, the, the, the language of, of, of cinema. We should do movies in English. No, we should do movies in Maya, in English, in Basque, in Catalan, in Spanish, in every single language. The second, if politicians have their way, and there is a trend from people that are administrating public money to believe that that public money is their own, just because through democracy or not democracy, they have access to these funds. Well, it is not. The responsibility of the, of the governments is to administrate well the money that the people have put in their hands to do services for the people. And among those services and among the service for the cause of peace, that, that is diversity, it's also to guarantee that creators can express themselves in a free way. And I think this is fundamental. And I'm saying it here because it is under threat. I have never seen so many signs of dangerous developments about the way politicians are understanding that movies have to be made. This doesn't favor my cause, or this doesn't represent my country, or this presents a, 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 <clears throat> my country in a light that I, don't want, and, and, that I don't want. And it resembles me a lot of things that we were hearing 30, 40, 50 years ago. Okay? Um, also, I think we have to support and to understand different forms of narration. One of the, of the, of the storytelling that dominates the world, it's an extremely sophisticated and very well-constructed way of telling stories. Okay, but there are others. Open a little bit your minds to the others as well. It is okay that we enjoy what is the majority of storytelling. It's fantastic, but open your minds to other ways of telling stories, other, <laughs> other ways of narrative, other ways of construction, because creators are looking to express for, uh, themselves in different ways. Movies now, movies are expensive to produce in general, but at the same time, the new technologies are allowing us to construct uh, images in a different way. Now you have editing, programs in the computers, you have uh, iPhones I, that you can use, you have uh, photographic cameras that have incredible video quality. So it's incredible how films, the narrative, are, are, are entering into our lives. Actually, I, I lecture in a, in a program that has been created by St. Andrews University in Edinburgh, the, the, um, Centro de, Investi de Investigaciones Históricas in Spain and two other universities, one in, in Italy and another one in, in Belgium, which is to teach historians, medieval historians, to communicate using the audiovisual image. And the first thing that we teach is forms of narration. And we show them how they have to tell the stories. Why? Because in the future, all what you're going to be doing is going to go through the internet and it's going to be audiovisual. But in order for you to be different from the others, you will have to find the difference, the diversity, what separates what you're doing from what other people are doing, which are very competitive. If you look at films that are different, you will find different ways in which you can express yourself. And you, if you see films that are more in the narrative, you also have to explore and find ways that are massively communicating yourself. So that would be very good, I think, also uh, for you. Um, films help to understand the reality around. When you see a movie about the outskirts of uh, Mexico City, or you see a movie about what's going on in Iran, or you see a movie about people having fun in Spain, you are understanding perceptions. It's not only the story they tell, how they tell it, how they see themselves in order to tell it. Because movies not only tell a story, they tell the story of everyone who has made it because through their way of thinking, they have a different way of seeing. And it's fantastic. So I advise you to see as many movies as you can if you're going to enter into the world of, 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 of 
culture or, or, or dissemination. And not only see the story that is being told, try to understand why they, they thought that they had to tell the story that way. What is it that they are telling about themselves? So at the end, and to not bother you more with this uh, speech, the whole way that we can have our aliens that come to the Earth thinking that we re really left a nice legate is to have plurality, freedom, diversity. So they find a huge array of things which may be confusing, but they will say, wow, these people really did very different things in very different ways, and it was fantastic. So they can stay, this alien civilization, long, long, long time trying to understand us, which is what we do through films. We try to understand us. So thank you very much for listening. It's quite a complex case, not the, the interview, because, uh, but definitely we cannot tolerate that anyone uses the powers that, uh, that are now with the new technologies to prevent people from seeing something. What you can do is not like it, and you can say you don't like it, or you can trash it, because apparently the movie is not very good. But uh, <laughs> so maybe had they let it pass, nobody would have heard about the movie. It would have been a total disaster. And now it's a huge box office success. Thank you to the propaganda that Korea has gone to the movie. So that, that is the, it has the opposite effect. Because there are so many movies produced in the world. There is so much information now running. I mean, every country has a lot of things that the fact that you'd help this movie with the communication is an extraordinary act of stupidity. Having said that, of course, it's, I mean, we, we, I think we, we cannot allow. But it goes deeper because it's, it's, you know, I come from a country where we have the so-called Inquisition for 400 years. The Inquisition was a tribunal of the church, and in this case of the Catholic Church, which uh, has been told for, <clears throat> is famous for the cruelty, whatever. It is not the cruelty that was the important thing. Actually, as a tribunal, it was less cruel than other me medieval and contemporary modern history tribunals. It is, the problem with the Inquisition was that it was the first established methodical control of the mind. The Inquisition was looking at you to see if you were eating the right food, doing the right things, speaking the right tongues. You could not separate from that. And if you would separate, you, would, you could have a real problem. So it's not the tortures and the burning that they were, but the total number of killings in the Inquisition adds to like 30,000 people in four centuries, and only uh, the burning of witches here in Germany in 13 something was 10,000. So it, it, it is, it's not the proportion. Every death is a disaster. One, a hundred, one million. But the, the real horror of the Inquisition and the weight that we still carry in our cultures, or not only Spanish, but also South American, because we exported it, was that we had to repress our thoughts because there was someone watching. It's the first big brother of history. So I hate when big brothers are going to be watching us. And, and of course, with the evolution of, of, of the way they can track absolutely everything we do and they, they can suggest, etc., there is a, an element of fear that every time we buy a book in Amazon or whatever, someone knows what we think, someone knows what we are looking for, etc. And at the end, the accumulation of information will control us. So it's not only regimes like North Korea, it is all around that we have to be very aware. And I have no idea because I will continue buying books in Amazon and I will continue using the internet and I don't give a damn if they know what I do. But at the end, they know what I do. They know the, the books that I read, the newspapers that I check, the, what I'm interested in, and the restaurants that I look in the guide and who I trust or not, the film critics, which I don't trust anyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so more questions? Well, um, the effect, I still don't know because it was a world premiere here <laughs> yesterday. So, uh, um, but the reality of what happened yesterday was that th through the, the, the existing rivalities, which go back, back to years because uh, there are families working in, in the business of Jerez since the, I mean, the companies that are still around since the 18th century. 
and and some of the people that you saw there that were talking about uh, the families, they are seventh or eighth generation of people doing, and they have intermarried among them, but they look at each other with suspicion. What this film has done by not identifying one brand, because it, this is not, it is a promotion of a way of living. It has what, what, what my friend from Nepal said, um, the idea of the film was to look at the, at the people who do the things and to, to, to have them explaining it to us and, and to show the enjoyment that they have out of what they do. Uh, so it's a celebration in a way of, of a very hard business and they say, oh, things are going back or we will be ruined. I mean, they, they talk very openly. We, we invented uh, part of the shooting, which was very complicated, but one of the things we did, we, were, we created open uh, round tables and, and we let them speak for hours and hours and we were shooting, so you have the spontaneity at the end, they, they come out like, no, I don't agree with you, whatever it comes. I think this will serve two, two things, or maybe three. One, for the people there, is to look at, 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 at themselves in a, in a new light because we, we show all the, all the people of the wine, from the workers in the harvest to the, to the executives selling the movies. And, and, and we saw the restaurants. So you, you've seen a couple of two or three star restaurants talking about the wine. Um, that, 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 for one, it's not easy to see the global picture sometimes. You see, you live in your house in, in, in any city, <clears throat> and you may not know your neighbors. Or you may dislike the neighbor uh, da, uh, up there because uh, the, the, the dog uh, barks at 3 o'clock in the morning and wakes you up. But you don't see the picture of the whole society that is in that house or the whole society that is around. So I think we should love what they see. So that's, that's one. And, and we will go and we are going to Jerez. We'll have screenings. We'll have discussion. We'll have panels. And the film is going to travel all over the world. It's now going to the Sofia Film Festival. We'll go to Guadalajara in Mexico. We'll go to a lot of festivals going everywhere. So it will open the debate. That's the second part. It will help them rediscover the proud of, of, of doing that wine, which is also, it's important. It's important when you, you do your work the best way you can and you get recognition. One thing that people are, Sometimes uh, they don't realize is that when creators do a work and someone has liked it, it's, it's great when they come and tell you, I love what you did. A lot of people say, no, nah, well, I'm not going to see. He knows that he's good. No, 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 no. Even the, the most famous distinguished director, they may be well, bored because they have a lot of people and exposure. But when someone comes and says, just want to say thank you for the work you do, that is extraordinary, because at the end, we're fragile human beings. You know? The rest is the, 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 the walls that we erect for, 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 to protect ourselves from the others. But at the end, when you've worked hard, you've tried to do your work very well, uh, it's nice to have a little compliment. The same when you will be bosses and, and with the people you work with. Huh? It's nice to say, hey, great, thank you, good job, which not everyone does. And it's good to recognize the job that other people have done. That's the good thing about film crews, that we recognize the great job. The, the musician here is extraordinary. We recognize the job. The director of photography, we recognize the job. But in other jobs, it's also good to say sometimes, hey, you did a good job. You're part of a family. We're all working together. And that's what is your job. You did a great job. And not, I did everything, and you work for me, you shut up. No? Which is what normally happens. Um, so what was the third thing about sharing? Sorry, <laughs> I've slept three hours. <laughs> well, I've, uh, well, help them sell the movie, the, the wine. I mean, and, and, and I think this is going to change the perception about the wine because sherry, sherry was the, the, the wine. Sherry represented 10% of the total sales of Spain in the 19th, foreign sales of Spain in the 19th century. 10% only this wine, and now not. And it, it was the, the, the quality wines, and then suddenly they started selling good wines, but the cheap ones. And now it's perceived as a cheap wine. When they have wines that are 30, 40, 50 years old, which are miracles of, of and delicious. And especially the Palo Cortado, that refers to the name, is extraordinary wine. So that's, those are the three things, I think.
<laughs> you see, the, what, what, what happens in, in countries that don't have the wine culture, and the United States are, are now having the culture, but before it was not a wine country, discovering wine is a fantastic experience. <laughs> there is a, a page in, in, in Facebook called The Mystery of Palo Corta, El Misterio de Palo Cortado, that you can follow the, our adventures and hopefully it will, in, not in theaters because it's a documentary, but hopefully it will get to some <clears throat> pay TV channels, etc. here in Germany. And I'm pretty sure that it will be in some festivals here uh, later also, again, and in the Instituto Cervantes and, 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 and all the things. But I, a little bit later, it will take, uh, first we will do the, the round of the commercial, but then then it will be the cultural uh, presentations of the of the film. Yeah, we, we first we try to get our money back. Yeah. <laughs>